The heat of the sun was tempered by a light caressing breeze. The wavelets gently massaged the chuckling pebbles at the sea's edge, and I abandoned myself to the luxury of idleness without guilt. This was the sort of contentment I had not experienced for a very long, long time. I sighed audibly with the sybaritic pleasure of it all. Wayne! Wayne! Come here, get your son out on! I sighed again, this time with exasperation, and opened a cautious eye which met the unblinking and unnerving stare of a stocky infant, probably about three years old, I'm no expert in this field, male with close-cropped blonde hair and bow legs. I opened the other eye and turned my head in the direction from which the coarsely masculine voice had come. It lighted on a female, also blonde, also stocky, and also, as far as I could judge, bow-legged. She was already well on the way to being sunburnt in all the places which were not covered by a day-glow puce bikini bottom. Beside her, seemingly lagered into insensibility, lay a grown-up replica of Wayne, only with tattoos. Beyond them the beach was completely deserted. I turned my head in the other direction. There, too, the empty beach swept around the curve of the bay. I groaned. Somehow a sigh didn't seem to meet the occasion. I returned my gaze to Wayne, who seemed to have grown noticeably more pink since we had first exchanged looks. I fancied he made a threatening gesture with his spade when he was recalled to the bosom of his family by the suggestion that if he didn't get his so-and-so son out on now, he'd get his so-and-so arse paddled. I smiled wanly at this pink budding delinquent, nodded at his pink parents, who gave me a toothsome smile, thrusting her pink breasts in my general direction, and then I walked off the beach, carrying my clothes with me. Early May, in the Costa del Sol. I assumed obviously wrongly that I would be free of the wanes of this world, especially as this was supposed to be a recuperative holiday. Last week, Wednesday to be precise, Prudence and I had finally, and I mean finally, parted. Not quietly or intelligently, not talking it through and promising eternal friendship. Oh no, this had been brutal and terminally wounding. That we avoided physical violence was only due to the fact that we were both physical cowards. On reflection, the only characteristic we had ever had in common. Anyway, I was swapping my lacerated pride. She had been particularly offensive about my honeymoon technique, as she winsomely termed it, with a drinking companion, who said, Easy, mate, take yourself off for a few weeks of healing sun, sea and sand. Balm to the soul, that is. Couple of days, you'll forget all about the woman. Actually, he was right. After a couple of days, I began to feel not only much better, but also, for the first time in years, a sense of real personal freedom. The minor irritation of Wayne et famille was not going to spoil my mood. After all, the beach was not the only place to be in Spain. Ask Laurie Lee. I wandered up to my hotel room, collected my guide to Andalusia, and strolled into the old part of the town where I could peruse it in the comfort of a bodega, which was so filthy I knew I would be safe even from the German tourists. Since it possessed neither jukebox nor one-armed bandit, I also knew that my solitude would not be interrupted by sun-dried families from Basildon. In fact, the only other occupant was an inebriated gypsy who spat inexpertly and frequently into or around what I imagined to be the last cuspidor in the civilised world. Sipping an ice-cool montilla out of a dirty glass, I settled down to working out my next venue of escape. Inland. Of course. Why hadn't I thought of it before? A pair of stout shoes and a rucksack. Take off for the Sierras. All that pure mountain air and gentle exercise. All I needed to complete the cure. As I left the bodega, buoyed up by my latest inspiration, the gypsy was being sick in and around the cuspidor. Never look back, my grandfather used to say. I didn't. The next morning, 
I hired a small car and set off for the mountains that form the backdrop to the coastal town in which I had been staying. On the way out, I was forced to break suddenly as a football bounced in front of me, hotly pursued by a manic toddler who quickly revealed himself as Wayne. Now completely red and peeling nicely, he was dragged back to the pavement by his screeching and equally toasted mother while being sickeningly struck upon the head with a six-pack by his father. I gratefully left the town and started climbing the winding hill. It was a perfect day. The sky characterised by an unbroken Andalusian blue. Hot, of course, but not unbearingly so, and the air was permeated by the smell of wild thyme. After a couple of hours driving, I stopped in the square of one of the villages, which, from sea level, were identified only as a cluster of brilliant white dots. A line of ancient villagers was sitting on the wall, which adjoined the village shop gnarled and wrinkled as the olive trees among which they had lived all their lives they studiously ignored me probably unused to strangers i thought to myself as i entered the shop walking in out of the glaring sun was like stumbling into a black hole and i had difficulty in identifying the provisions from which i intended to make my lunch but eventually i emerged carrying what i hoped was some cheese some olives a loaf of bread and a bottle of red wine. For some reason, I also seemed to be carrying a box of panscaras, which I'd fondly imagined to be a packet of biscuits. The cheese smelled awful, and I decided I'd better have my picnic at once in case it deteriorated further. i just got to the car when one of the old men on the wall called out to me. Senor! I waved at him and smiled but he beckoned me over with his stick and, in surprisingly good English, said, If you are driving around in the mountains, senor, you should certainly have a spare wheel in case you have a puncture. His friends, who appeared to understand what he just said, nodded in agreement and made clicking noises. Oh, it's all right, I replied. Have a spare wheel. <laughs> I checked when I took the car over. Not any longer you don't, senor, he said, and indicated with his stick down the road, up which I had just driven. I saw a group of grubby children leaping down the hill, using my spare wheel as an overweight hoop. Hey! I shouted, but the sound of my faint hysterical yell was still echoing round the hills as the wheel left the road and, given an exuberant bound over the embryonic parapet which bordered the hairpin bend, disappeared into the depths of the countryside below. The old man shrugged his shoulders, and the group, as one, closed their eyes and disassociated themselves from the event. Muttering, I dropped my evil cheese and the scouring pads onto the passenger seat and made my way up out of the village and further up the mountain. I suppose I'd done little more than a couple of kilometres when the car lurched to one side with a puncture Ah, oh, well, I thought. Summer will be along sooner or later. Might as well have a bite while I'm waiting. Now, happily, this part of the road was bordered by an olive grove, which offered some shade. Still at the wheel, I lurched the car over to a section of the road which had been cut into the bank of the grove, thereby forming a primitive lay-by. And I clambered up to the base of one of the trees, there to eat my lunch. I was ravenous and even the thought of the puncture and what it was likely to cost me couldn't spoil my anticipation of it. That is, until I unwrapped the cheese. It smelt like the lavatory at the bottom of Highgate Hill. Frightful! The bread had baked like a brick while on the front seat of the car, and the bottle of red wine had assumed the temperature of something one drinks mulled at Christmas. I sighed again. Sighing was, I decided, becoming rather too much of a habit, and dejectedly sank to the ground between the exposed roots of the ancient tree. I dejectedly rose again on finding that I had sat on a pile of goat droppings, cunningly camouflaged by a few pitiful wisps of dead foliage. Well, they were dead then. Probably they had flourished proudly on this parched hillside until defecated on by some incontinent goat. Anyway, I found some old leaves and wiped off the worst fervently hoping that no one passing would catch sight of me wiping myself with my trousers on. 
I've had no formal training in these matters, you understand, but I judged the goat dung to be tolerably fresh. Perhaps it was the cheese. I don't suppose I will ever know for certain. But suddenly the grove was full of goats. Big ones with horns, small ones, obviously female ones, and even more obviously male ones. Goats with bells and goats without. Goats of every size, colour and breed. They were fixing me with yellow eyes and resolutely moving through the olive trees in my direction. I'm not frightened of animals, but the smell. The cheese I'd hastily dropped to the ground seemed to shrink visibly away from the combined odour of the herd of fetid goats. I was about to scramble back down the bank to the sanctuary of the car when a shout stopped me in my tracks. It wasn't the volume of the voice that held me, but the quality. Here... In the mountains of Spain, from the middle of a herd of stinking goats, floated the melodious and finely tuned tones of an English public school. I say, I say, do hold on a sec. I held on, riveted by the sight of a filthy scarecrow, emerging from this amorphous heap of goat and waving a shepherd's crook at the end of a scrawny, rag-festooned arm. As this extraordinary figure came closer, so did the smell, which hitherto I had unfairly attributed to the goats. I say, are you English? came the cultured tones again. Yes, I stammered, uh, backing away into an even more recently deposited pile of goat dung. Ah, uh, uh, are you? Of course I am, he grinned at me through a disturbing mixture of matted beard and rotting black stumps. Had I unwittingly stumbled into the only leper colony in Spain, I wondered fearfully. He held out why I assumed to be a hand, although where the rags ended and the flesh began it was impossible to say. I looked at it and said hastily, I had a skin complaint and it would be better to dispense with the handshake. Oh, good Lord, yes. He stopped in his tracks. Hate to catch anything in this godforsaken place. Do you, do you live here with, with them? I weighed vaguely at the sea of goats, smell and excrement. Live here? Oh, I should say so, he answered. Aren't they just splendid? He went on, bestowing an equally vague benediction over his herd. I've been here for the last... Um, his face contorted with the effort of recall which merely served to redistribute the channels of dirt from which his face appeared to be composed. Well, he went on, it's been a hell of a long time. I was in banking, you know. Got fed up with all the commuting and traffic and the fumes and the smell, <laughs> he continued. You have no idea. Awful. By this time, I was almost comatose from the current assault on my own nostrils and said chokingly, didn't exactly drop out, he mumbled. Sort of forced on me, if you know what I mean. Had to leave a mite suddenly. His voice had dropped to a furtive level, and he gave the side of his nose a conspiratorial tap. Something seemed to fall off it. The fact is, he continued, almost caught with the old hand in the till. <laughs> Still, all in the past. And now this is all mine. He waved another vague hand in the direction of his herd, which gazed adoringly at him. They were obviously highly impressed by something that could smell worse than they did. Suddenly his attitude changed. He stiffened and appeared to be staring at something down the mountain. At first I thought it might have been my cheese which had captured his attention, but on turning my gaze in the same direction I saw a number of villagers strung out across the hillside and heading in our direction with axes, bill hooks pitchforks, and guns. I turned to ask what it was all about, but goats and goat herd had disappeared, totally. It was uncanny. One minute they were there, and the next they'd gone. So while trying to work out what had happened to them, the armed peasants had reached my position and were sniffing the air appreciatively. We see you have been trying a local cheeses, one of them said to me, and then went on to explain 
that they were trying to clear the area of itinerant goat herds who, it appeared, played havoc with the crops. Suddenly his eyes glazed over and he stopped, lifted a foot and peered at the, well, he called it evidence. Vainly trying to scrape the sole of his shoe clean on a tuft of grass, he called out something to his companions, who then surrounded me, making threatening gestures with their assorted weaponry. I turned my head to see one of them pointing at the seat of my trousers and nudging his neighbours. They laughed. Then the one who had first spoken to me said, We think that you are the lookout for these goats. You warn them of our comings, hmm? I started to protest, but it was no use. They took me down to the village, past the old men on the wall who jabbed at me with their sticks, and pushed me into some vile smelling stable under one of the houses. I was there for two days, nothing to eat but the ghastly local cheese and bread, and a sanitary provision completely out of proportion with the bowel problem induced by the cheese. Eventually, I was taken by the local guardia back down to the coast and told I had to leave within hours. They drove me to the airport and put me on the next flight back to Gatwick, a journey on which I was accompanied by Wayne and company. They were sitting in the next seats to me, and while in the air his father consumed fourteen lagers and spent most of his time occupying one of the toilets. His mother spilled her creme de menthe over my lap while Wayne stood by my knee and flicked bits of peeled skin over me. On landing, I went straight to the car park to find someone had taken all the wheels off my car, even the steering wheel. My visa card had been impounded by the car hire company in Spain while they sorted out how much I owed them, so in desperation I telephoned Prudence. We live together again. We don't like each other very much, and sometimes she hits me, but now I think I've got a cold coming on.